patriarchy has given men the fairy tale called Delulu Land. And in Delulu Land, these men get their own mini domicile. They get themselves a servant mom, wife figure. They get themselves some children. They get themselves a home cooked meal and everything they need to play to their emotions and take care of their needs. In Delulu Land, these men are miniature kings. I would think that they are kind of like colonizers as well because they are mining the resources of their women and children. Now, what has patriarchy done to shape these young men's minds starting at a young age is, is, pretty, is pretty crazy. They feed them a fairy tale, a delusion, hence the name Delulu Land. Now, I am actually reading a book and it speaks to how these young boys are giving these these tools, these fairy tales early on that shape their brains. And then they end up middle-aged men still living in the Lulu land. But let's take a look at this passage. I've been reading passages from Why Does He Do That? Now, I want to talk about how a young boy would get these messages, these cultural messages that reinforce that they are entitled to a certain thing, a certain home, a certain lifestyle, and their woman servant is part of that. Let's start at the bottom of this page. Let's return now to our growing boy. From a combination of different cultural influences, he develops an image of his future, which he carries within him. He pictures a woman who is beautiful, alluring, and focused entirely on meeting his needs. One who has no needs of her own that might require sacrifice or effort on his part. She will belong to him and cater to him, and he will be free to disrespect her when she sees fit. I'm sorry, when he sees fit. In his mind, this picture may illustrate the word partner, but a more accurate word for the image he is developing might be servant. I'm using this because this is the language that they use to talk about us when they talk about submission and cooking and cleaning. And that's your role as a woman. And your role as a woman is just to birth kids and be pretty. That's it. We get this. This book came out 20 years ago and we're still getting the exact same messaging. When this boy gets involved in actual as opposed to imagined dating, especially as he reaches an age where his relationships become more serious, his childhood fantasy life collides with the real life young woman he is seeing. She defies him on occasion. She has other people in her life who are important to her rather than making him her exclusive focus. She demands from time to time that he take an interest in her as a person. She doesn't always accept his opinion as accurate and superior to hers. She may even attempt at some point to break up with him as if she were not his personal possession. The boy doesn't believe that he is demanding anything unreasonable. He seeks only what he considered his due. In fact, our young man feels like he is given, he gives his girlfriend more freedom than a lot of other guys do. Just as the boy in our opening story felt generous for providing a public picnic area on his land. And like the, that boy's reaction to the trespassers, um, he becomes increasingly frustrated, erratic, and coercive as he tries to regain control over his partner. His first se actual experience, experiences are likely to be as a result of his pressuring a girl steadily until she gives in. So that sexual coercion becomes one of his earliest relationship habits. He may even start to appear mentally ill, as did the young man who began, began firing at hikers. But in fact, his behavior is largely logical and rational, given what his key social influences have led him to believe. Above all, he feels that his rights are the ones being denied, which is precisely the attitude of almost all of my clients when they begin my program. The abusive man feels cheated, ripped off, and wronged because his sense of entitlement is so badly distorting his perceptions of right and wrong. In some, an abuser can be thought of not as a man who is a deviant, but rather as one who learned his society's lessons too well, swallowing them whole. He followed too carefully the signposts his culture put out for, for him marking the path to manhood, at least with respect to relationships with women. I bring this passage, passage up 
because the ancillosauruses of right now are so angry. They are failing and flailing because women of right now actually have choices and are assertive and assert dominion of ourselves and have autonomy. And they are failing and flailing because the wife, the mom to wife pipeline is drying up and they're not getting their due. They're not getting the woman that they thought that we were going to get because so um, society told them that they were going to get this woman. So they are acting out. And that is what we're seeing today. Boys often learn that they are not responsible for their actions. Boys' aggressiveness is increasingly being treated as a medical problem, particularly in schools, a trend that has led to diagnosing the medicating of boys whose problem may really be that they have been traumatized and influenced by exposure to violence and abuse at home. Treating these boys as though they have a chemical problem not only overlooks the distress they are in, but also reinforces their beliefs that they are out of control or sick, rather than helping them to recognize that they are making bad choices based on destructive values. I have sometimes heard adults telling girls that they should be flattered by boys' invasive or aggressive behavior because it means they, they really like you an approach that prepares both boys and girls to confuse love with abuse and socializes girls to feel helpless. In most media coverage of bullying and school violence, including highly publicized school unaliving such as uh, Columbine, reporters have overlooked the gender issues. Headlines have described these events as kids unaliving kids when close to 100% of them have involved boys unaliving kids. In some cases, it has been revealed that the unalivings were related to boys' hostility towards females, including one case in which two boys who went on an unaliving rampage said afterwards that they had done it because they were because they were angry that their girlfriends had broken up with them. But the urgent need to confront the anti-female attitudes among these boys was never mentioned as a strategy for preventing future school violence. I am skipping around this chapter a little bit, but I want to talk about this part. A girl's, a boy's early training about sex roles of, and about relationships can feed abuse. At least until quite recently, a boy has tended to learn from the most tender age that when he reaches young adulthood, that he will have a wife or girlfriend who will do everything for him and make him a happy man. His partner will belong to him. Her top responsibility will to provide love and nurturing while his key contribution will be to fill the role of the brains of the operation, using his wisdom and strength to to guide the family. Tightly interwoven with these expectations are other messages he is likely to receive about females. He may learn that boys are superior to girls, particularly if he grows up around men who exhibit it, who exhibit that attitude. In many families, there's no worse insult that you can give to a boy than to say, you're acting like a girl. That's the reason why I do not like it when a man or a boy is acting out and we women feminize the insults towards him because it just reinforces that being a girl is an issue, not their destructive behavior. When he is old enough to know about sex, he may learn that the most valuable things about the female is their capacity to give pleasure to males, depending on what his father or stepfather is like what he, what kinds of peers he chooses in his late teen years, or what kinds of music he listens to. He may learn that when a female partner does not defer to him, he can use verbal degradation or even physical intimidation to punish her and ensure better cooperation in the future. So they learn this and it is reinforced in culture. Okay, so that is the end of this passage. This book is a must read. It's 20 years old, but if you read it today, it still speaks exactly like what we are seeing going on right now. And it is precisely how we get to the point of Delulu land, where these men think that they are the prize and that women are here to serve them. Okay, let me know what you think about this. People act like Disney is the reason why women's perception of marriage is that of a fairy tale when men have bought into the fairy tale as well, because the fairy tale simply does serve them more than it serves us because they have turned women and children into their personal servants. This is an 
um, excerpt from the monthly um, from Housekeeping Monthly in 1955 is called The Good Wife's Guide. Okay, so this is a guide to how you can better serve your man. Women have been getting these messages. We have been socialized into these messages forever. So when we talk about these things, we have got to recognize that women and girls have to be deprogrammed because the programming runs deep, is generations of socialization that have led us to this point. And there's so much infl- so much flux right now, so many people wiling out because th- there's an extinction burst. These men are losing their servants and they don't know how to act. So let's look at this guide. Have dinner ready. Plan ahead, even the night before, to have a delicious meal ready on time for his return. This is the way of letting him know that you have been thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. Most men are hungry when they get home, and the prospect of a good meal is part of the warm welcome needed. Prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you'll be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup. Put put a ribbon in your hair and be fresh looking. He has just been with a lot of work-weary people. Be a little gay and a little more interesting for him. His boring day may may need a lift, and one of your duties is to provide it. Clear away the clutter. Make one last trip through the main part of the house just before your husband arrives. Run a dust cloth over the tables. During the cooler months of the year, prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by. Your husband will feel he has reached a haven of rest and order, and it will give you a little lift too. After all, catering to his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. Minimize all noise. At at the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of washer, dryer, or vacuum. Encourage the children to be quiet. Be happy to see him. Greet him with a warm smile and show sincerity in your desire to please him. Listen to him. You may have a dozen important things to tell him, but the moment of his arrival is not the time. Let him talk first. Remember, his topics of conversation are more important than yours. Don't greet him with complaints and problems. Don't complain if he's late for dinner or even if he stays out all night. Count this as minor compared to what he might have gone through at work. Make him comfortable. Have him lean back in the comfortable chair or lie him down in the bedroom. Have a cool or warm drink for him ready. Arrange his pillow and offer to take off his shoes. Speak in low and soothing and pleasant voice. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment or integrity. Remember, he is the master of the house and as such, will always exercise his fairness and truthfulness. You have no right to question him. A good wife always knows her place. Now, what man, what man would not want this fairy tale? They have been getting this message. They have been getting this message for generations. And we have heard this reiterated in some variety for the generation that we live in, in some capacity. Y'all, what do you <laughs> what do you think about this? And which part was your favorite? Tell me. <laughs> Don't forget to like, comment, and share.